Hi, everybody. You know, we all admire people who work hard at their jobs. And our guest did that for 25 years with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Mark Cressy became the Dodgers bullpen catcher in 1974. And three years later, he was promoted to be the Dodgers bullpen coach under Tommy Lasorda. And he held that job until 1998. Mark, great to see you. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Ross. It's great to see you. I haven't seen you in years, and you haven't changed. You look great. Uh, you too. Thank you. Mark, we're going to have plenty of time to talk about your baseball career, but I want to start off today by talking about your favorite hobby for so many years. And folks, it has oh, there to it is. It has to do with baseball bats. <laughs> Seven years ago, Mark decided that he could take cracked baseball bats and make them into lamps. Wow. How'd you get that idea? Well, Ross, it's a, it's a great, it's, I think it's a funny story because we'd just gotten beat by the Atlanta Braves and Tommy was doing his post-game tirade speech. And I'd heard it a few thousand times. So it wasn't like a unique speech that I should be paying attention to. <laughs> my, son, my son, Brad, had just gone from the baby stage to the toddler stage. So we were converting his room from cribs and things into a nice little room for a, a young toddler. So that became a story because I was sitting in the clubhouse and my eyes were kind of looking down because I've kind of was listening to Tommy in one ear and just kind of waiting for eat, be able to eat dinner in the other since we were, hadn't eaten after the game. And I looked over and right next to my locker, about 15 feet to my right, Steve Garvey had gotten jammed that day and his bat exploded. So the barrel part went one way and he's left with the handle in his hands. So the barrel, the bat boy had brought those in because basically it was trash and it was sitting by the trash can near my locker. But the barrel part, was real pretty. He was using a Louisville slugger and the grains of the wood were still beautiful. And you could see where the ball had been hit by the, on the bat on the barrel a couple of times before it took that drudgery of getting jammed and breaking. So I was thinking, you know, it had Garvey's autograph, you know, it was a Garvey model and he was the MVP in the year before in 74. So I said, God, there's got to be something I can. Then all of a sudden it hit me. I needed a lamp for my son's bedroom and, and I wanted it to be unique because everything was baseball. I mean, obviously when you're dad's in the big leagues and you know you know you got a baseball motif kid so i said here's what i'm going to do i'm going to take that barrel with the, the cool part with the name on it and i'm going to saw it flat so it's so it could stand up on 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 a base and what i did is i went over to the, the lumber yard and i bought a real nice piece of oak wood and i cut it into the shape of a home plate then i took my router and i made a little bevel on the side of the plate just like the real plate does and i painted it white and then I took that, oops, and then I took that barrel and I drilled a hole through it. So I had about 18 inches of, to drill through. And Ross, my neighbors hated me for a while because when, <laughs> you drilled, when you drilled through there, once you got about halfway through, it sounded like an echo chamber and it sounded like a canary getting raped. I mean, it was <laughs> all, everybody down the street could hear this, this squeal. So anyway, then I went to the lamp store and bought a, a metal rod to, put, to go from the bottom of the, of the base through the barrel of the bat and then put the electric part on top. So now my last thing I needed was some kind of lampshade. So I thought, you know, let's try this. And I went to the Dodger Stadium and the, 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 the stadium sells those cheapish helmets made out of plastic so the kids can have them. So I, the little thing inside that fits to your head, I just pulled that out. So all I wanted was the blue shell that said L.A. And I drilled a hole in that, and that was my lampshade. So I, it, it turned out, so that was for me. I just did it for my own good. I had a lamp, now a cool lamp, one of a kind, Steve <laughs> Garvey, broken bat, played in the game, and there it was in my son's room, right? So I was, that was it. So then my neighbor came in, and he says, God, what a cool lamp. Could you make one for my kid? And I said, sure. So next lamp that broke, there we go. I don't know, it was Kenny Landro. It could have been Steve Sachs. It could have been anybody, right? Who's ever had the unfortunate of getting jammed and losing the bat, right? No. So then, so then it, Jerry Doggett, this was back way back. Jerry Doggett came and did a Dodger dugout show in my garage talking about these lamps because it was a different kind of story. So there I was That's good. making a lamp and then it went on TV. 
And then it, it, it went crazy. And people, people, I, I couldn't even keep up with it. I had to buy bats whole and some because I couldn't keep up with the, what, what people wanted in, in the broken bat department. I had, to, yeah. I had to use regular bats and saw them up just for the purpose of making a lamp. So that's- How long, how long did it take you to make a lamp? One. One? I could, well, making one was hours because it took hours to, 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 to route it, to sand it, to do everything. But when I, I got to the point, Ross, where I would have, a, I had a guy with an injection mold company that, I, I paid him to make the, the, the base part so he could whip those out. It looked just like wood. It looked exactly what I would do myself, but it was made out of an injection foam. So he would, I would order like a hundred at a time. So that, there, there you go, man. That's how it all started. It all started because of Brad and, uh, and, and having a lamp in his, in his be bedroom. Did you ever figure out Mark, how many you made and all? No, no, I, I really can't. And then probably the coolest lamp I ever made when Roy Campanella was alive and he started hearing about all this Mark Cressy making lamps and stuff, he had a bat from all of the starting nine of their Brooklyn Dodger team that he played on the last team. So I had nine bats. So what I did is I made, I made two bases. One was very big. It was about the size of a car tire, the base, because I needed a nine sided. Well, I, it wouldn't be an octagon. Well, I don't even know what you call a nine-sided figure, but I know an eight, eight wasn't enough because there were nine, nine bats. So I had this configuration of a stop sign, but there were nine different facets to it. And I had the whole bat. So I would dowel them in. And, I, and this bat was really cool because the middle part was just like a real lamp. It was like a table lamp. But I had all nine bats were funneling to the middle size before I ran it back up where, there, where the I put a regular lampshade on because this thing was big. It weighed about hundred pounds when I got done with it, but Roy loved it. And it was, it was pretty cool. I wish I had a picture of it. I was really mm -hmm. proud of it when I got done with it. Oh yeah. Are you still doing that? You know what? I don't, I, I, when we, 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 uh, we've moved a few times. I had all my tools in seal beach when I was working with the Dodgers, but when we moved to the desert, I really didn't have need for all those tools. So I just had a garage sale and got rid of all my band saws and and table saws and routers and stuff. So I didn't, I didn't need any more. And I didn't have the room at the, when we sized down. Mark, did you charge people for the lamps? You know what I did, but I, you know, when I think about it, I remember it was $25 and about five years after I started making them baseball cards and memorabilia went out the roof. Yeah. Had, had I Ross not gone through the hassle of making those bats and just kept the broken bat, each, each of those broken bats would have been valued at, you know, a hundred or $200. And wow. I sawed them up and worked my, my tail off to make $25. Uh, and so I don't even know. I don't even yeah. know. It's probably the stupidest move in the world. Well, thanks for, for bringing us up to date on that. I always thought that was a unique copy that you had and people really like what you had made. So now let's go back to Mark Cressy. Baseball career man. Okay. You in Southern California. What high school did you go to? I went to Marina High School in Huntington Beach. Okay. And then you then you played baseball as a catcher. Uh, I guess Golden West College, and then at Cal State Long Beach. Actually, Ross, it was backwards. Um, I went okay. my freshman year to Long Beach State mm -hmm. because in high school I started school in Japan. My dad was a career Navy man. Oh. So I should, unfortunately, he started me in kindergarten when I was barely, I hadn't been turned five yet. So yeah. that's a big story because when you're a, a boy and you're an athlete, being the youngest guy in your grade can be detrimental. You know, it's good I know, to be about, I know about that because I skipped the first grade and here, oh, I, well, yeah, you're, here I am in the second grade and I'm five years old and right. that, that put me behind athletically. But fortunately, fortunately, I decided to be an announcer and not a star basketball player. <laughs> well, true, but but you know what I'm talking about because if you're when you graduate from high school and you're and you're 17 and all the guys you're playing with are 18 or 19, you you know it's just a big disadvantage because that's when you're doing all your your maturing and your muscles are coming in. So that's what happened to me. I went from an average player in high school to my senior. My difference. I weighed about 175 pounds my senior year. After my soft, my freshman year at Long Beach State, I weighed about 215 pounds wow. uh, and I could hit a ball probably another 100 feet than I could my senior year. So I was playing in this league in Long Beach. It was uh, the Connie Mack League. And I was the only guy at nine home runs with a wood bat out of Blair Field, which was a pitcher's nightmare. Wow. So 
I had scouts meeting me at my car telling me, they said, look, if you go back to Long Beach State next year, it'll be three years before you're eligible for the draft. Right. She says, he, and this was the Cardinals scout telling me this. He said, right. if you go back, if you go back to a JC next year and enroll in a JC, we'll draft you. So as soon as I heard that, Ross, I called my coach at Long Beach State and said, man, I really appreciate Mr. Gonzalez, all you did for me, coach. But I'm going and I, I, I enrolled at Golden West, made all state, got drafted by the Cardinals and I started playing. Yeah. So you were drafted in the third round um, and then you joined the Dodger organization. And how did that come about, Mark? Well, that's kind of that's kind of crazy, because at the time I was trying to I was trying to I'd just gotten released by the Cardinals and I couldn't blame them. I, I was meeting. I wasn't hit, lighting it up at all. And it didn't help. I when I when I went into college at those times, Vietnam was on. So as soon as I got out of school. To, to and sign to play baseball as soon as i lost that student deferment they, i was going to go to vietnam you know yeah. so they immediately the cardinals got me into a reserve unit so yeah. i could you know so i could stay in the united states right. so i got in the national guard and that really was tough because the cardinals who signed me had to pay one for one weekend a month wherever i was playing in the minor leagues they had to pay for my flight back let's i was playing at florida state league okay yeah. so once a month they were footing the, the bill for a guy that was hitting 230 to fly from Florida to, to uh, Los Angeles for a weekend and then fly me back to go back to play with my team. So I was thinking, I'm much how longer, I much I wonder, I wonder how long these Cardinals are going to pay for these flights for a guy that's not ripping the cover off the ball. No. So obviously uh, at the end of the season, they let me go. So I still thought that I, 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 I could make it like any kid that I didn't want to, until they told me you're done, I was going to still try. So I was, sure. I had gone to a tryout camp with the angels and I hit pretty good. And I thought I was going to sign with them. And I get a phone call from Ben Wade, the scouting director of the Dodgers. So the, yeah. the best thing I had Ross going for me was my work ethic and my attitude. I mean, That's you right. could tell me that whatever you told me I was going to do, and I was going to do it to my best of my ability. You so, were always great at that, Mark. Thank you. Ross. You, you really help people. And, and you took, I never heard you complain once. Well, I, I, I tried not to because I loved baseball. And, uh, I, I, you know, my job with the Dodgers at the time as a coach was to help other people. So at this time, before I got this job in the story, is I, I wanted to keep playing. Okay. So Ben Wade called me up and said, hey, when Steve Yeager's going to catch, Joe Ferguson sometimes going to play right field because Willie Crawford is a lefty. And when it gets left-handed pitchers, they're going to get Joe's bat in there. So if they got Jaeger behind the plate and Fergie's out in the outfield, there's no one to catch the pitchers in the bullpen. Okay. So they said, we need a bullpen catcher really bad. We need it really fast. And spring training was just about, just about over. So the Dodgers had come back for the final, you know, freeway series. So they invited like nine guys to come out for this job. So the first thing I had to do was catch, um, uh, oh boy. Al Downing. It was Al Downing. So he said, Get, uh, Al Downing's going to throw a bullpen. Can you catch him? I said, sure. So I went down there. I caught Al. And if you can't catch Al, you couldn't catch anybody because wherever <laughs> you put your glove, Al was going to hit it. So I had no problem catching Al Downing. And they said, do you throw batting practice? I said, sure, I can throw batting practice. All catchers do because they, they usually their arm short arm arc, they throw sure. it. And I threw BP all the time to my buddies so that I could hit off of them when they take turns. So I went over there and they said, go throw to this group. So I threw 15 minutes and guys were like lining up to hit off me because I, I was throwing firm right down the middle. They loved it. So so then they said, can you hit a fungo? And I said, sure. I hit them all the time to my buddies when we're working out. So they go, go hit some fungos to Garvey. And I said, okay. So I went over and hit some fungos. So here comes Lasorda because Alston was at, in the tail end of his career. So Walt wasn't exactly a fire plug toward the end there. He was great manager, and but he's real quiet. It was like the opposite of Tommy. So Tommy was with all the guys on the team in 74 there. This was 1974. 80% of them played for Tommy at Spokane. So Tommy was really like the, the manager that was in charge of the workout. That, and, he come, and Tommy came over and he says, hey, congratulations. He says, we pick, I picked you. You're our guy. And I said, for what? And he goes, to be the bullpen catcher. And I said, well, I'm Tommy, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to sign on with the Angels. And he goes, what'd you hit last year? And I said, 2.30. He says, 2.30? And you're going to pass up this job to go back out there, probably get released again? He says, you better think about this. And I said, well, 
Tommy, I, I said, I, this is a tough decision because, I, you know, I have this dream of playing in the big leagues. He says, yeah, but it's got to be a reality. Who knows what this could lead into for you? I said, oh, OK, so I'll think about it. Can I call you tomorrow? He said, sure. Call me, call me tomorrow. So I went home, Ross, and I can't tell you, I probably got zero sleep that whole night. And every every 30 minutes, I changed my mind. Yes, I'm going to do it. No, I want to go play. Yes, I'm going to do it. So finally, about wake up time, about 730 in the morning, I decided, I said, man, Sometimes you got to be a realist and say, maybe I'm not good enough to play in the big league. So I called Tommy up and said, I'll take the job. No. And, and that was it. He, I became the bullpen catcher. But Ross, in those days, in 1974, the average age of our coaching staff was like my age now in their 70s. So no. they, they were too old to throw batting practice. That's Nobody right. could squat and, and take, you know, hit ground balls. So basically, Ross, I was like that drummer guy that has the drum going like this with a harmonica <laughs> this way and playing the uh, cymbals. Uh -huh. So I was throwing a couple hours of batting practice every day, hitting fungos to just about everybody that wanted them. And I, I was throwing batting practice. I was, just, you know, I, then I'd go warm up the pitcher. So Joe Malfitano, I love the guy. He's still alive. I love him. I talk to him all the time. Joey said, if they ever get rid of you, Mark, they're going to have to hire five guys to take your place. So yeah. I, that was that was a pretty good compliment coming from I think one of the best baseball men in the history of baseball. Right. Well, you became then after three years as a bullpen catcher, you became one of the youngest coaches in professional baseball at the age of twenty five. Now, when you became the bullpen coach, um, did you ever catch pitchers in the bullpen again? Again? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I was under the impression as a, as a, as a doing when I was a coach and I was still young enough to squat and catch, rather than just stand there like you see all the guys that do it nowadays. Yeah. To me, to me, the best view you can see of the spin or how our ball's breaking or how a ball's coming out of his hand or if it's a change up the speed in relationship how it's coming to the to the plate. Yeah. I don't think there's a better place than to be the catcher because you can't, you're, you're not, it's it, no matter where you stand, if you're just standing there, you're not in the same angle that the ball's coming toward you at, at the plate than the catcher. He's the best view. Obviously the umpire would be then second best view. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, I said, as long as I'm spry enough that I can catch a guy, I'm going to catch him, even though I'm the coach, because I could see the spin. I could see the arm angle, you know, like oral, was it was about as smart a player as you've ever want to do. So when I would warm up oral, he, some of the keys we would, we would talk about is where his elbow, the slot of his elbow. If he was, if his elbow was too low, all I would do is take my, my glove and tap my elbow and raise my elbow a little bit and he would fix it on the next pitch. Wow. You know? So, I mean, and, and things like that. And, and then when he was throwing his breaking ball, we had our names on our back. So his was Hershiser. So the R, was all located behind his right scapula. So when he would deliver the ball on his breaking ball, if, if I couldn't see the R on his back, then all I had to do is tap my R and on the next pitch, or will be able to show me his R and fix the spin. So the, the little things like that, I couldn't do that if I was just standing there holding a clipboard that's like right. most of the guys do. That's so right. that's why I did it. You work with four pitching coaches, Red Adams, Ron Paranowski, Dave Wallace, and Glenn Gregson. Was it important, Mark, that you talk frequently with the pitching coach who wanted the pitchers to, you know, either work on mechanics or improve and develop their pitches and other things? You know, Ross, those four guys were really good, and they were, you know, really good pitching coaches, and they all had their own way of doing things. Like Red, even though I was the bullpen coach, the, the starting pitcher would go down with me. Red wouldn't even come down to the bullpen when the starting warmed up. Like Ron Paranoski. He and I were like a team going down there. Ron would be down there. So um, a lot of the times, the only time, Ross, that I ever called down in the in the Red Adams era was we were playing the lumber company, the Pittsburgh Pirates, back yeah. when they had Stargell and, and, and all those big monster Dave, guys. Dave, killing Dave the all all yeah. those guys, Dave Parker, you name it. So Doug Rao, who was like a you know change speed specialist, I mean, he wasn't one of those guys going to light up the radar guard gun he was the guy that was going to pitch that night against him so i warmed him up and you know he wasn't necessarily a hard thrower to begin with but this night ross i swear i think i could have caught him with just my batting glove i mean <laughs> i mean he had nothing so it was the only time ross in 20 you know 25 years that i i, I got on the phone when doug left to go back to the thing to the uh to the to the dugout to the start of the game i got on the bullpen phone the only time i've ever done this 
And I, and I called down and I told Tommy, I said, Tom, I said, you got to keep a, a, a quick eye on this guy because he has nothing tonight. So he had a no hitter going in the seventh inning, Ross. Oh, <laughs> so, oh, oh. so, so sometimes, sometimes having nothing is better. I always tell the kids that I coach right now, I said, here's what you want to do. You either want to be higher than the norm and throw harder than the average player or throw softer than the average player. Yeah. Because if you throw the norm, that's where you get in trouble. So <laughs> that, that, that night throwing soft, they, they just couldn't hit him because they couldn't wait long enough. So yeah. it worked for a while. Remember the night that Tommy went out to replace Doug on the mound and Doug said, I'm not leaving. <laughs> yes, that was that Doug, Doug, <laughs> Doug's one of my all time favorites. I mean, yeah, his attitude right. and you know, what was good about Doug with a, a, for a guy that really had really average stuff. He made his changeup was so good that that's what made him good because he could change speeds. Okay. So it, whether you throw a hundred or whether you throw 88, as long as you've got something to change speeds off of that, that's the key. So Doug was really good. But the thing that Doug did have was he thought he was, he was uh, Nolan Ryan or something. He thought he could get anybody out. And, you know, a lot of your fans, I'm sure have seen that famous tape of Doug and Tommy on the mound and Tommy saying all the bad words, that's a pretty funny tape, but you can hear Doug saying, I can get this guy. I can get this guy. And Tommy would say, well, you didn't get the last five guys. You know, so, <laughs> so that's uh, uh, that, that was, those were the good, the good days because uh, there were some great Dodger players. Mark, let's kind of uh, talk about Dodger pitchers. And I'll ask you who, who had the best fastball that you saw? Well, let's see that, uh, you know, for, I'd have to say that one of the best fastballs period that I ever that I saw in a Dodger uniform was a guy by the name of Alejandro Pena. Mm -hmm. When, when Alejandro Pena threw the ball, he was so strong that, that his ball had a unique spin. And when it hit your glove, it was like catching a bowling ball. I mean, every ball is basically the same weight. They all weigh the same amount of ounces, but when, when the pitch comes in the spin, it burrows into your hand or it burrows into the batter's bat. And when it's heavy, it's, we call it a heavy ball. I'm sure you heard heard of that many a time when you're interviewed your Dodger players. They talk about this guy throws a heavy ball. Yeah. Well, Alejandro's ball moved, and it was he was he was a nightmare to catch because it never moved the same way. And when it hit you, if you hit it you on the thumb, it was like it was like you felt like your thumb was broken every time you catch the ball. So especially yeah. when you had to catch Alejandro Pena in Candlestick Park before a game when it was like. 40 degrees with a wind chill in the 30s uh -oh. and his and that ball hit your glove it was like holy cow ross it was like somebody hit you with a with a, with a sledgehammer what about bobby welch didn't he have a good fastball he, he did have a good fastball but ross he, he, it was a live fastball and when you say the name bobby welch i still can't believe he's he's dead he's That's way too young to be dead that was a shame but uh, another great story great kid and uh and, and, he, and he did have a good fastball, Ross. I mean, there's no doubt. It was, this was more of a straight fastball, kind of had a little ride to it. Yeah. And, uh, and, then, and while you're talking about good fastballs, you can't forget Steve Howe. No. Steve Howe, no. Steve Howe was an electric fastball. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I remember <laughs> kind of funny story. He had a zero ERA going to, into the first time he was uh, suspended. So right in the middle of uh, – Right at the end of June, his ERA was still zero, and he got suspended, and then they suspended for the year. So then the commissioner decided that he was going to suspend him again throughout the whole next year. So we were at the winter workouts. Ron Paranowski, we were at the season hadn't even started yet. The people that lived in L.A. would go to Dodger Stadium before spring training to get a little start on it. So here's, there's Steve Howe suspended for the whole year even after spring training and everything else, and he's throwing batting practice. And so usually when you're throwing batting practice as a pitcher, you tell the, the batter what's coming because, you know, if you fool him that bad, he could hurt himself, you know? So Mike Sosha was batting and Steve Howe was pitching, you know? So, and I was catching. So when, so here's Steve throwing gas and it's, it's, we haven't even gone to spring training yet. So poor Mike, you know, he, he, he hadn't even taken a swing yet and he's facing a guy throwing 90 plus, you know, <laughs> batting practice. And all of a sudden out of the middle of nowhere, didn't even tell me besides not telling social, he decides he's going to throw a change up and he probably threw the best change up of his life. And Mike almost <laughs> broke a, a disc in his back swinging at it. So, so uh, he, I'll, I'll love this line, Ross. It's a, it's a classic. Here's my, here's Ron Paranoski standing next to me outside the batting cage. And he goes, Perry, what'd you think of that? And Paranoski yelled back, don't peek too soon. 
<laughs> he was suspended for a whole year. And he tells him, don't peak too soon. Oh, that's great. Who had the best curveball? Well, Don Sutton, probably by far. Yeah. Um, Fernando Valenzuela had a good curveball. Jay Howell had a good curveball. Um, Steve, uh, the reason why I remember Don Sutton having a good curveball is usually when the pitcher is pitching in the bullpen. In a game, the catcher calls the signs, puts the signs down, and calls the pitches because the, otherwise, if the pitcher was given the signs, the batter would see them. So the, right. in a game, the catcher gives a sign. Well, if if you're in the bullpen or you're before the the warmups in the, in the game, the pitcher tells the catcher what's coming by signaling with their hand, uh, shoot hmm. forward with your hands, a fastball. When you go forward like this, is my picture on the TV? So when I go like that with my hand, is your audience hearing or just verbally, or can they see my hand like that when I do that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So anyway, so anyway, Don, we were he was getting ready to pitch against the Pirates in Pittsburgh, and he he, he must have been thinking about something. He forgot to tell me that a curve's coming. So I was anticipating a, a fastball, and I was still young in those days, so I didn't wear my shin guards because I was cocky and I knew I could catch anything. And so, but he forgot to tell me, right? So his the reason why I told you his curveball, I mean his curveball broke off the table, Ross. It would come straight at you, and then all of a sudden it would just dip. It would go straight down. So, so here I was expecting this fastball. And then all of a sudden the ball disappeared and it came right down on top of my kneecap with no oh. shin guards on. And oh. it went from my Ross, the, the, the stadium in those days in Pittsburgh was three rivers. Uh, it was a, uh, yeah, three rivers. I think it was called. Yeah, right. And yeah. And it, and it hit my, the bone of my kneecap and bounced up into the second deck. So that's oh how hard it, hit. it went into the second deck. And oh. so, and it, made, it made a noise like it hit a piece of wood. And when Don oh. did it, he realized he forgot to tell me he felt so bad. <laughs> And I can't believe it didn't break my knee, but I made it through it. No problem. So I don't yeah. know why, but when you asked me about that curveball, immediately I thought about that. Sure. That's how good it was. Oh. I, mean, I couldn't put a glove on it. How about the best slider? Oh boy. Well, let's see. Um, let me think back the best slider. Well, Todd Worrell had a good one. Um, Todd, Todd Worrell's slider was really good. And Alejandro Pena again, that was his, other pitch was a slider. You know, I was pretty lucky, Ross. I got the um, – Tommy took me with him. Every time we won the, the pennant, I would be the bullpen coach for the National League in the All-Star game. Right. So when you're talking about great players, you know, and who I caught, I caught the best names in, the, in baseball because I caught Steve Carlton. I caught, you know, yeah. all those guys. I caught uh, Tom Seaver. I mean, yeah. I, I caught all those guys. So when you're thinking about sliders, Steve Carlton's slider was pretty nasty. I mean, it was really nasty. But let me go back to this. Is, we're talking about Dodger fans listening to you. Um, sliders, sliders, sliders. You named a couple. And, okay. And who are you going to choose for the best changeup? Well, Doug Rao for sure. Oh, Andy Messersmith, without a doubt. Really? Yeah. Andy, you could, Andy's, uh, Andy's, um, he, had, he called it a three-finger loose grip changeup. And it was funny because all visiting players would come over and ask Andy how he threw it. And Andy never told the guys how he actually really did because he didn't you – know, it was kind of like when Bruce Suter was, first came out, you know, with a split-finger fastball. Yeah, yeah. He was unique, right? So he oh, was yeah. unique throwing that. Hard so that's what made him so good because no, no batter would get any other looks at a split-finger because nobody else threw it but Bruce Suter. So he yeah. was unique, right? Then all of a sudden, when everybody started throwing it, it was no longer unique. Okay. It was like, you know, it's the same split finger I saw the other day off of this guy. Okay. So then it got, it got to the point where he got hurt. So Andy says, I'm never going to have some guy be throwing my change up because I'm never going to tell him. So sometimes it was hard for me to keep from laughing because I would be getting ready to go catch Andy in the bullpen. And the guy would come over and say, Hey, Andy, how do you grip your change up? And he <laughs> gripped this God awful grip. And I, I always blew it a couple of times to start laughing because, and then he looked at me with this grin on his face. Oh, when, when they warmed up in the bullpen before a game, did every pitcher have the same number of minutes to finish getting ready? Pretty close. I mean, it was always 15 minutes before game time. We would start playing catch. All of them. Everybody had about the same time. The exact number. The only guy that really had the exact number all the time was Sutton. He had 
he was like so regimented. He'd throw that this many fastballs in, this many fastballs away, this many changeups, you know, this many curveballs, and then he'd throw the same amount from the stretch. So he'd throw his starter with his windup, then he'd go to a stretch. But it was all so regimented. His was like, he was like a robot, and he was really good. Was there a pitch count? a limit to how much you wanted the pitchers to to throw because, you know, the old adage, you don't want your pitcher to leave the game in, in the bullpen. And right. was, that, was that a problem for anybody? Only the relief pitchers. Uh, the starters, the starters really don't have the time to really, you know, throw too much. If they, if I thought once they're, once they were ready, I would pretty much say, I think you're ready, bud. You know, and they'd get the idea that it's time to shut it down, you know, but um, the relief pitchers, and our, and especially with Tommy, Tommy would always have, he never wanted to be caught, you know, not ready. So he would have guys up. Some guys would be throwing, you know, up hot five times. Okay. So that's where I became really important for me as the bullpen coach, because especially a young kid, when he's all excited, he's in the big leagues for the first time, you know, he's all pumped up and he hears his name, go get loose. Well, it's really important, you know, for me, when I get, would get a young guy, I would always talk to him and tell him, look, I want you to get close your first time up, okay? Because you never know if if the the rally keeps going, you could be called on and you get eight pitches when you go out there. So you got to put that in your bank that you've got eight more, no matter what happens, you've got eight more. And you'll probably get about another eight by the time Tommy didn't make the, the changes. Uh, Bill Russell, I mean, uh, Ron Paranoski did. So Ron would always intentionally walk out pretty slow. So it would give me time to get some serious last couple warm-up pitches so the pitcher could get ready. So all, all we would do is get our pitchers, our, our relief pitchers ready one time really hot. So, and then the next time they would come up, they would just kind of play catch. So they had eight warm-up pitches to get ready, and they didn't waste any of their bullets down in the bullpen. Yeah. So that was, that was a big deal because, you know, you, you, like you said, you could waste it in the bullpen and then go out there with nothing left in the chamber. And that's where you make your money out there in the game. Let's turn our attention back now to some of the Dodger pitchers that you caught. All of them, Don Sutton on September 22nd, 1976, Don faced the giants in San Francisco. He was looking for his 20th win of the season you and Don started walking down toward the bullpen to warm up. Yep. Uh, and uh, I'm going to assume that the weather was not exactly balmy on that no. particular night. No. no. <laughs> and and uh, what did Sutton say to you? Okay. Well, it was kind of, it was, see, Don, Don was nice guy and cocky. Okay. So, when he first came up, he and Walt Alston used to rub heads a few times. So he and Walt would, would butt heads once in a while. So we were walking out to the mound and it was kind of like what, you know, being cold at candlestick is like a hundred percent of the time. That's right. But being cold and drizzly rain, it was really bad. So this, this, he's getting ready to go warm up in drizzly rain, freezing cold with wind, like you're in Alaska. So he looks over at me and says, I'm going to win my 20th tonight. There's no doubt about it. And I looked at him like, I like that attitude, Don. I said, how do you know? He says, because when I first came up, Walt used to tell me, he says, it'll be a rainy day in hell when you win 20 games in the big leagues. <laughs> he says, here we are. <laughs> so I thought that was the perfect line for that one. Yeah. And he went the distance. He beat the Giants uh, three to one. Bobby Mercer stole home for the only – Giant run in that ball game, and then then after that, a couple of days later, he pitched a complete game shutout against Houston, won two to nothing for his twenty first victory. It was the only season in his twenty three major league years that he won twenty games. You know what his salary was that year? One hundred and fifty six thousand dollars. That's scary. That's scary, Ross. And and you know to think about that, even in the sixties, thinks. Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale had to hold out to get a hundred thousand. That's right. And now the major league minimum is like six seventy. So <laughs> here's the two two of the when you talk about if you ask me a question, who are the greatest Dodger pitchers of all times? Even though they were out gone by the time I was there, you got to put Koufax and Drysdale up in the top right. five anyway. That's right. It's not That's one right. and two. And there yeah. they were holding out for a hundred thousand. Guys get that now just to go on TV for a commercial. That's right. Yes, Don, sir. Sutton, Don Sutton never missed even one turn 
in the rotation. He made 756 starts. That's the third most in baseball history. Cy Young had 813, Nolan Ryan 773. And Mark, I got a trivia question for you right now. Are you ready? Uh oh. Uh oh. I don't won, know if I'm ready. Who won the most games, Nolan Ryan or Don Sutton? I'd probably say Don Sutton. Don Sutton, 324 wins. No awesome. 324 wins. The same number. Ross, yeah. I caught Nolan Ryan at the All-Star game. He, he was amazing, but I swear to God, I swear to God, had he not been worried so much, everybody talked about his strikeouts. Yeah. He he was worried more about striking a batter out than get a guy out, okay? Whereas, yeah. like a Tommy John, Tommy John was happy with a ground ball out. Sure. Or Ryan, because of the publicity of Nolan Ryan being the, you know, the gun shooter, the guy that can strike everybody out, he throws so hard. He would throw guys, you know, he had a nasty curve, too. I mean, he oh, wasn't yeah. just a hard thrower. Ryan's, Ryan's curveball yeah. was scary good, okay? Yeah. And he would throw his curveball 3-2 to guys, you know, and end up walking them and giving up some runs sometimes, like you know, to cost him a win here and there, simply because he was trying to strike them out rather than just get them out, and, yeah. uh, and in my opinion. And, I, you know, here's a flunky that, that didn't make it to the big leagues talking about a, one of the greatest pitchers of all times. But I think had someone – talked to Ryan and told him, said, look, if if you get a guy out on a ground ball, you might get a guy out with one pitch. If you strike a guy out, you're throwing a minimum of three, that's probably that's more that. than that to strike the guy out. So he probably, he probably could have lasted longer even, you know, and, and had he just been more apt to just getting the guy out. No, Nolan Ryan was in the major leagues for 27 years. Now that's the record. I don't think, Mark, that he ever went on a disabled list, if I can remember. He told me one day that the key to his success was that he went swimming at home about every day, and it strengthened his legs. That's that, I'm and sure, and I'm sure it stretched out his shoulder, so that you know he was never in a position where he could really hurt himself because he was stretched out. Swimming is a great exercise for throwing, no doubt. Yeah, seven no hitters. Yeah, one of them was against us, Ross. Yeah. It was kind of funny because when when we would go to the Astrodome, and then and one time there was there was be Brian, Mike Scott, and Joe Negro maybe. Joe Negro, yeah. No, it was another one. Oh, it was J.R. Richards. No, J.R. Richards because Joe Negro he could get you out, but he yeah. didn't scare you. Well, yeah. J.R. Richards, Ross, that was one of the nastiest guys because. Oh. He was the starting pitcher of the All-Star game, and then I was the bullpen coach. So there I was catching him. It was kind of, it was kind of getting dark about game time. Uh, Dodger Stadium, nineteen. That Dodger Stadium, correct. So I go to catch him, and I'm still standing up. It was the first pitch he was going to throw. So I'm standing up. I'm not in my crouch yet because the pitcher has to take a few throws to get his arm loose right before he tells you to get down. So I'm standing up. I don't have my mask on. And he lets go of his first warm-up pitch, which is usually like 50 miles an hour for most guys. Well, he threw it. It was like 95. I, mean, I barely got my mask, my glove up in time to protect my face. I mean, I, I said, I told myself, I said, man, I said, if it gets much harder than this, I'm not sure if I can handle this guy. Right, I mean, he, right. he, he was as bad as nasty a pitcher as you could, as you could, as you could face. And many a time, I mean, look in his career. Bill Russell didn't dodge anybody, but many a time when we go into when we go into the Astrodome, and he figured out when uh, when Jr. pitched was Jr. was pitching. Yeah. Either Billy Russell or Davey Lopes would mysteriously want a day off. Yeah, nobody right. wanted to face yeah. Jr. Richards. He was so nasty. Mark James Rodney once beat the Dodgers thirteen consecutive times, and, and I, yeah. he was, he was as good as anybody. Yeah. Could see, I'll tell he you. was. He was, you know, Ross, when I was, I got to go to AAA for a little bit with the Cardinals and uh, Jr. was pitching at Oklahoma City for the Astros. And I saw him come into the park and here I was a kid wearing like a, a sweater from like Woolworths for like 20 bucks. And I looked over and he, I saw him walking into the clubhouse and he had this cape on, looked like Zorro. I mean, it, was, it had the cost of a pebble thousand in those days, but here we go. I'm going to face this guy. You know, coming to put my uniform on, but after I come walking in with a, an outfit that costs maybe thirty bucks, and I'm going to go face this guy. He looked like uh, he looked like a movie star, and he was he was nasty because those those lights 
and the minor leagues are like half of what the Dodger oh, yeah. legs were. So you could yeah. hardly see the ball. And it was yeah. hot. And, you, and then here it was looking like the size of an aspirin the way he was right. throwing it. He was. He, was had great, he had a great slider too, didn't he? He sure did. He sure did. Everything he threw was hard. And Ross, the one thing that we you got to talk about, I call it being conveniently wild. Every now and then he would go through a period where he couldn't, he didn't know where the ball was going. And yeah, as a hitter, when they're like that, that's not too much fun because, you know, you're expecting a major leaguer. If he wants to come inside, they'll come inside, but they'll put it in a position where you can get out of the way 99% of the time. Yeah. JR's, JR's could have gone anywhere. I mean, it could have gone in your ear hole in your batting helmet. So he wasn't a lot of fun to bat off of. No. no. Did, you, did you warm up Tommy John on July 17th, 1974, the night he tore? In, Phil in Philadelphia? In, Phil in Philadelphia? Oh. Was everything routine that night when he threw in the bullpen? Did you? No, he was facing Montreal. The 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 game the 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 best game that I could ever think of Tommy John throwing was the playoff game in Philly when he won a complete game and it rained the whole time and and well, yeah, he beat he beat Steve Carlton four to one and that was game game four of the nineteen seventy seven NLCS but I think he was I think he was here uh, that night. When he, okay. faced, he faced Montreal, and I was wondering if you noticed anything when you warmed him up. It was a, a danger sign. No, not not really, Ross. I, I don't remember anything. You're you're first of all, you're Ross Porter. Your memory and your your facts are one of a kind. I mean, I would never want to play Trivial Pursuit with Ross Porter. I mean, I you're know. amazing coming up with the things you're coming with. It would take me. I'd have to put notes down on a piece of paper, and you're coming with stuff between your ears. You're amazing, man. Thank so you. I, 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 you know, I can't even remember half the stuff I did yesterday, let alone yeah. what you're talking about. So you don't remember warming up that night, and uh, not did, really. Did you, I, did, I can, re I can you remember think? the. Go ahead, go ahead sir. No, go well, ahead. When you think about it, what he did in Philly, just when I when I'm just thinking about a memorable starts for Tommy John, you got a pitcher pitching on wet aster turf. Right. Whose whose forte is a sinker ball. So which right. means the guys are going to hit the ball on the ground. Right. And when the guy hits the ball on the ground on wet AstroTurf, it's like a like a, a Super Bowl that hits that AstroTurf and skids through. So when it hits the wet AstroTurf, it actually picks up velocity. So that would be like that's like the worst thing that could ever happen to a sinker ball is play pitch on wet AstroTurf. Yeah. And he pitched the game of his life. We yeah. we went into the we went we won the playoffs. We beat the Philadelphia Phillies and. And it was all because of Tommy John that night. He was like, that was like, there shouldn't have happened. A sinker baller on wet AstroTurf should have got his booty kicked. Did you think he'd make a comeback? You know, Ross, I can't tell you. When he was, when he first came back, when he was coming back from his surgery, I was the catcher, you know, for all his workouts. Ross, he would flip the ball. My wife, Jean Ann, could throw harder than he was throwing for 45 minutes. It was kind of hard. It was really kind of hard to concentrate because it was like playing catch with like a five-year-old kid. And Tommy, would, you know, he was told, he was told to build it up by throwing more than, than, than normal. So he would throw 45-minute bullpens. I mean, it was, it was a lot of squatting for me. Oh. So and that, what he was flipping in there, Ross, was pretty hard to believe that he was going to come back and make a comeback with what he was flipping. But, oh. but, it, but sure enough, after time, here it comes, and it would it would be a, a visually different. It would get better and better and better, and then he did, his forte also, like we were talking about Doug Rao, his forte wasn't velocity to begin with. It was the movement, and his yeah. sinker just got better and better. And he pitched, you know, for the Yankees after he got done with us. Oh yeah, he he pitched. He went twenty six years, one year behind Nolan Ryan. They were the, the most active Amazing. players in their time. And uh, it's funny you said that because. I think Tommy John once said, uh, I asked uh, Dr. Joe when he operated to give me a fastball, uh, but but he gave me Mrs. Koufax's fastball. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That was he was he was pretty quippy. He, uh, Tommy John was a nice man. Really yeah, was. He was. And another amazing statistic. This is one of my favorites, Mark. OK. Tommy John won 124 games before his operation. He won 164 games, 40 more after the surgery. He wound wow. up at 288, and he ought to be in baseball as all of them. He should. He should. No doubt about it. I agree with you 100%. When you, you know, Dr. Joe, 
he he saved so many guys' career. You know that that they should do some special thing. Yeah, uh, he was he he back in you know in the fifties and stuff when a guy would he get an elbow injury that required the Tommy John surgery. There was no Tommy John surgery, and those guys' careers were over. That's right. And he's turned he's turned players where guys actually threw harder after surgery. So yeah. I mean, he he was amazing. He was amazing. Well, somebody said, and I think they're right. They should have named it the Frank Joe surgery, not the Tommy John surgery, because Frank told him before the operation, I think we have a 1% chance of this being successful. Wow. How about that? That was that 1%. There's not a player that wouldn't have taken that 1% chance. It's better than the alternative of never pitching again. So he pitched till he was 46 years old. Yeah. Well, uh, Ross, not, I, I, Ross, I don't know if you mind me going on a tangent for a second about Dr. Joe, but I'd, no, like, to, I'd like to say one thing. Um, Fred Clare was our general manager, and we were going over some things, and Ramon Martinez was with us along the same time with his, his brother, Pedro Martinez. So we, were, we needed a second baseman really bad, and Delano DeShields became available. Well, Fred was on the phone. I'm sure he did it with all the coaches, but he – he was sharing my opinions too. So we, he would, I'm sure he talked to some of the other guys first, but um, in my opinion at the time, Ramon was a really good starting pitcher, but he was on his way down on the slide. And I, then I thought Pedro Martinez has just started touching his, his abilities. So in my opinion, they were, there was a chance to get to Lionel for either of the two. I, when I hung up with Fred Clare, my suggestion was trade Ramon. Okay. So the next yeah. morning, the next morning I woke up and I went out to get my newspaper and I opened up the paper and there's a picture of, of Pedro uh, uh, up, up with Dodgers trade Martinez. And it says a picture of Pedro. And I goes, Oh God, how can the paper make that big a mistake? Putting the wrong picture in there. Then okay. I read the article and, it's, and sure enough, they traded Pedro, right? Well, you know, a lot of people get on Fred Clare about they, some people call that the worst trade in major league, uh, the Dodger history. Right. Or one of them. Right. Well, Fred, Fred was going by one of his one of his most trusted allies was Dr. Job, because Dr. Job was, you know, he operates on some people and he has some information that nobody else has. Yeah. Well, Dr. Job had done a a a, a, a rotator um shoulder um, surgery on Pedro's non-throwing shoulder because he heard it taking some swings in batting practice. Mm -hmm. So he had to do a shoulder surgery. So in his medical opinion, he told Fred Clare, the general manager who has to pull the, the trigger on these trades, he told him that his in his medical opinion that Pedro Martinez's connective tissue is very weak. And in his medical opinion, he would have, if they, between those two, he would trade Pedro simply because he thinks he's a he's an accident waiting to happen. Okay, mm. so so this information was between Fred and and um, and Doctor Joe. He didn't share that with anybody else. That wasn't said in anybody else's ears. So that information was Fred hearing from Doctor Joe, and and I kind of correlate the same thing with when Needin Fear gave up the home run to Jack Clark when Tommy went out to talk to him. He told, look, we got Van Slyke hitting next. We're going to bring in Jerry. To Jerry Royce was warming up with me. We're going to bring him in, but let's try to see if Jack Clark will fish for something off the plate before we just walk him intentionally. So Tommy first sucked pitch. up. Yeah, so yeah, first pitch, pow, home run, right? So it would have been really easy for Tommy to cover his little rear end a little bit by when all the reporters were in front of him. The easiest thing for him, Tommy, to not look bad would have said, hey, I told the guy not to let him not to throw a strike, you know, and and he, uh, he you should talk to him. He's the guy that threw the ball over the plate. And that's why he hit the home run. Right. But Tommy never told anybody. So no, he and the, other part, of the other part of that, Mark, was when you looked at the stats, Jack Clark had not had good success against Tom Needenfuhrer in that's the career, in the career. But yeah. He, he, hit he just took one. that one. He just took that one. Now, so there, it, it was kind of. There was so, talk also that Tommy thought that Pedro Martinez was too small, right? And he was not one of his big backers. Yeah. Well, uh, the reason why let me let me just take a second. The reason why I correlated those two stories together was like Fred Clare could have done the same thing. 
instead of all these fans for decades thinking Fred made the stupid trade, he could have shared this, the information he had about Frank Job, which hasn't been shared. This might be the only time it's ever been shared, me to you right now, after all these years. And here's okay. Fred, you know, Fred's getting older and he, he still sucks up a lot of bad Dodger fans on doc talk shows all the time. I hear people talking about the bad trade he made. Well, there's a lot of information that went into that. Well, also and Jody Reed was the key. He was the Dodger second baseman. Fred made him a tremendous offer. He turned it down. Correct. Then he had to make the deal and he, he should be, you know, he should not be accused of, of doing something wrong. He had to find a second baseman. And as it right. turned out, you know, Jody Reed never made a deal with anybody to get any money. He was through yeah. after that. After that, very, yeah, that very was bad. That was, it. That, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about uh, Bobby Castillo taught Fernando Valenzuela how to throw the screwball. <laughs> Castillo was right-handed. Valenzuela was left-handed. Did you notice a difference in their screwballs? Oh, without a doubt. I mean. Every now and then the teacher gets surpassed by the student. So, I mean, in this case, Fernando's had the ability to, to really take his, his screwball to another joint over, over his delivery, where it was his screwball broke about like as good as a major leaguer's curveball. Whereas Bobo's would, it, it would break, but it was nowhere near the drastic break and the, and the sharpness of the break that, that Castillo's was. So Fernando's was like, sick good it was really good and then mike marshall had a had a really good one too he asked when mike marshall would throw his screwball it almost looked like he separated his shoulder every time he threw the ball he did things with his shoulder that the average person can't do he he was really a strong pitcher for that for us in 74. mark what was your biggest thrill in baseball oh well i i'll, I'll tell you this was kind of this is kind of cool in, in in 1988, it was the first game against the the Oakland A's, and here we were, here we were, um, going against the team that had won all these games with all these guys that were future Hall of Famers, and and we were probably like like Bobby Costa said, we we're probably the the weakest team to ever take the field in a World Series. So and Bobby, we use that Bobby Bob Costas, Bobby, Bobby Costas, right? So. So when we were down, uh, the last time I saw Kurt Gibson before the game was I'd always poke my head in Tommy's office and I say, good luck, Skip. And I poke my head in there and Kirk was in there in his underpants with ice bags on both knees and both shoulders. So I, you know, in my opinion, I thought, well, this guy's out, you know? So, and here he was our, he was our heart and soul and we don't have him against this best team. So I think things are tough. So, it was it was it was the eighth inning, and my wife came down, and I had my son Brad, who was nine years old at the time, and she said, "Well, I want to go get a glass of wine with the wives. Can can Brad sit down here?" And I sat down in that bullpen next to this families along the fence down there for ten years. So I, they knew me, they knew my son, they knew everybody. So Brad, they would they more than were happy to hold on to Brad for another inning. Until the game was over, I would walk out the bullpen and go get my son and take him into the clubhouse with me. So there was Brad. My wife had gone. She went up to have a glass of wine with her friends. So Jay Howell, I get a call, and he said, look, if we go to a 10th inning, Jay's our guy. I said, okay. So here comes Eckersley, right? So you're thinking our chances of getting a couple of runs off Eckersley aren't too good. So I couldn't see right field because in the bullpen where I was warming up Jay to my right was this hut that we sit in so that we can kind of concentrate on the game and not have to answer the fans questions and stuff that they would try to yell to us all the time. So we were sitting in the book. Then I was sitting in the bullpen when the hut rang, they said, get Jay up. So I start catching Jay. I yelled out to Jay. I said, Jay, don't waste any bullets. I said, the last time I saw Gibby, he was wearing underpants and had ice bags on both shoulders and knees. So I said, I, I'm not expecting anything out of this one. So I said, just take it easy. If we, if we do tie the game up though, you gotta be ready. So just get close. So Mike Davis walks, which was an amazing story. Cause that didn't happen very often. So oh, yeah. he walks. So when, when, when he steals second, when we have a runner on second now with two outs, I said, we got to get pretty close Jay now, because if Jay, if he gets, if he gets jammed, he could single 
I could see him singling something in there and maybe and tie this game up. So now we got to get ready. But when I, when I would look at right field, all I could see was the side of the hut. So in order for me to see anything in right, I had to lean back like I was doing the limbo to see what was going on in right. So the, you, you remember seeing clips of Kurt's at bat against Eckersley about the first two swings, he almost fell down, you know, with his follow through, he couldn't take the pain. He almost fell down. So that's all I was thinking was, no, I don't know about this. So, and everybody's heard the story about Mel BDA scouting report and it was written right in the scouting report. You can bet your bottom dollar. If, if you are a left-handed batter and it's going to be a three, two count, he's going to throw you a back door slider. It was, it was all in capital letters. So I actually, now that I saw this thing so many times, I saw Kurt step out cough time right and he's and and in some interviews and in, in specials about the, the famous home run that's kirk right. actually says that that line was entering his that's in his that's thoughts that's, that's, that's why he called time out to think about the backdoor slider so anyway sure enough backdoor slider it wasn't exactly a beautiful swing it wasn't like watching uh, uh One, bryce yeah. harper or somebody it wasn't like watching a perfect fundamental swing it was ugly swing and he almost fell down but he hit the ball out front and he's strong so when he hit the ball when i was turned around to see what happened with the pitch when i turned around all i could see i said wow he hit that ball pretty decent because he hit it out in front you know where the contact point is pretty good and i arched my back and all i could see was conseco with his head down with his hands on his knees looking down at the grass so that's a good sign right i mean he wasn't going to catch the fly he that was over his head so when it went out of the ballpark, we all went ecstatic. So everybody, on the, I opened up the gate. All my relievers go flying out. I picked up the balls and my catcher's equipment, and I was halfway to the infield to join the team, right? And all yeah. of a sudden, all of a sudden, it hit me. I forgot something. My nine-year-old son was back there in the middle of the melee. So I always wondered, Ross, all these years later, there had to have been like 50,000 people still in the park. They're probably wondering, What's that dummy running the wrong way? <laughs> so they're probably that number 58 so stupid he ran the wrong way. But that's that's what happened. I forgot well, my kid. So he me, said that was the greatest moment of my life right there. Let me add something to that. That night, my assignment was to do the post-game interview on radio. So 19, right. I go downstairs, it's four to three Oakland. I'm saying to myself, I don't know who I'm going to interview if they lose the game. Right. I walk in the dressing room and on the training table, there's Gibson, no shirt, has yes. his pants on. He's looking up at the TV set. Right. And at that time, Vin said to Joe Gary Giola on NBC television, Joe, I'll tell you one thing we won't see tonight, Kirk Gibson, he can't oh. possibly play. Gibson heard that and he turned and he yelled, Mitch, Mitch, Mitch right. Poop was the clubhouse attendant. Right. Mitch came in and he said, you go tell Lasorda I can play. So he goes he down for about two minutes. He's gone. He comes back. He said, Tommy said, get dressed, take your practice swings in the cage with the wiffle ball. But whatever you do, don't show yourself because I don't want Tony LaRusso to know that you are available. Correct. That's what happened. He walked down. I was right behind him, Mark, all the way down. I got down there and all I could see over the right field bullpen were red brake lights of cars leaving the stadium. Exactly. Everybody <laughs> and, was leaving. They thought the game was he, over. Perfectly. He he said to himself when he got up there, uh, and, and another thing that I never that I didn't re realize at the time, but I thought about it later. If Mike Davis gets thrown out trying to steal second base, Gibson yes. never gets to hit the home run. Never, never gets yeah. to hit. Yeah. But pretty uh, amazing. Oh yeah. And he hit pretty him. amazing story. I am also I'm also of a mind to say that if Scully had not said that to Garagiola, I'm not sure Gibson would have ever called exactly. Mitch. Exactly. I agree. There's so many things that went into that. And then, and then, I mean, I think your listeners know after they listen to you, just, I mean, I, it's not like you have it all written down in front of you. I've thrown some stuff at you and you come back. So it's not like no man alive has the chance to go look stuff up on the computer as fast as you do. It's up there in your computer. And I mean, so Vinny was, was like that too. Vinny had obviously you, you and he works, you know, I mean, he could come up with stories with anybody. And, you know, when he's, when he said that in the year of the impossible, the yeah. probable, the impossible has happened. I mean, where do you come up with that? I mean, that's amazing. It just did. It just did. Well, one of your favorite people, 
is you and Gene Anderson Brad. He was a catcher on LSU's national championship college team in 2000, first team All-America, won the Johnny Bench Award as the best collegiate catcher, and he had the game-winning hit in the ninth inning of the final against Stanford. He singled in the winning run in a 6-5 to five game. That had to be one of the great thrills, and I'm sure you and Gene Ann were there. Well, there's no doubt about that, Ross. Um, when you asked me what my greatest thrill was, I was going to admit, uh, you know, that, that was my greatest thrill without a doubt, but I didn't want to sound like that on a broadcast when I'm supposed to be talking uh, about the Dodgers. So if you're talking about the greatest thrill of my life, I, that was definitely had to be one of them because we were there and my poor wife, you know, she didn't ever obviously play in, the, in professional baseball. So she was sitting there when Brad was batting. And she goes, I can't look, I can't look. And I swear, I thought she was going to have a coronary. So I, I said, just watch the game. Just watch the game. So so when Brad got the hit, I had her on my arm. And it's amazing what you can do when you're like out of your body, you know, so, an event like that. I had her up and up in my arm. I had her lifted up, above, you know, she was off her feet. And I was so happy. And here I had my, you know, I don't even, she weighs 120 some pounds or whatever. She was <laughs> up in my arm like she was a feather. And we, we were hugging and, and uh, I, all, all I know is that there were like seven other dads and stuff that were around me where I was sitting from LSU. Yeah. And my phone was back in those days. The phone had like a little plastic clip that you clipped on your belt. And when we were jugging up and down, that phone had come off and we were spending like 15 minutes just destroying <laughs> my cell phone. Uh, we, were, we were all jumping up and down and there was my yeah. cell phone at the bottom just getting yeah. crushed. But well. Ross... Sanford had two first round pitchers in that, in that year, both of them pitched against us. The first guy was Wayne. And I forget the second guy, both of them made like six, six million in the draft. They were, they were, you know, they were like studs. And yeah. when Brad, I mean, they were, they're both of them threw nasty sliders and that was, you know, one of the toughest pitches to, to, to hit. And Where did the Brad hit go? Hit. Where did the hit go when he got it? The hit went right past the, uh, the shortstop hole toward third base i mean he smoked it and uh, it's not an ideal when you're facing a slider as a right-hander you're blowing up the middle in the other way it's yeah. kind of like your best your best bet but he'd been just thrashed by sliders the whole series you know he the year before when he went to omaha he had some long bombs home runs and stuff but there were so many right-handed high draft picks in this one they were they were using brad as the guy not to let him beat because he he's hitting almost 400 he hit 32 yeah. homers and he had 106 RBIs. So he was like the guy not to beat. So when, when he got that, that big hit, you know, that, that picture of him get, at first base, he had his arms up and was there when they won. when Ryan Terrio, who ended up being a Dodger also signed, signed with the Cubs and played for the giants and Ryan Terrio, he was the second, he was the second baseman at LSU when Brad was there. Wow. He scored the, he scored the winning run. And, uh, when he got that run, Brad was at first base and he had his hands up in the air. And that picture, Ross, is in every restaurant in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, yeah. So every yeah. every time every time we go to El Bellas, uh, back to see Brad and his family, we always go into a restaurant. And sure enough, there's oh. Brad when he was a kid. He stayed know. in he stayed in Baton Rouge. He had what six years in the minors, and I think four of the six years he got the triple A. Yes, but, he did. But then he retired. Yeah. Well, Ross, it was kind of tough because you know, his first year, the but there were a bunch of guys, Brad Hop, uh, uh, Trey Hodges. There were a bunch of guys that played in the big leagues off of his team at LSU when he was a senior there. And Brad was the only one that went to high A. They all the other guys went to rookie league, you know. But they thought Brad, they thought Brad was ready, so they sent him to high A, and immediately hit 17 home runs in less than a month. I mean, he tore it up. He tore it up. So they they buy, invited him to big league camp the next year, and all the articles were showing Brad going to be the Diamondback catcher for the, you know, for the next foreseeable future. But they changed the swing. They told him his, his swing was too long, and they changed. They took away his his load, which was the way you're cocking your hands. One of the things that Al Campanis did with us when we were when I was first starting to coach as a Dodger, he implemented this rule that. Nobody makes a change on a player until his, his production in a game requires him to change. 
So like when Fernando was looking up at the sky or when Nomo would turn his back to the target, as long as they're going to win 20 games, let them do it. You know, it right. the guy, they didn't care if you're a Craig council with your hands up over your head or you're Eric Davis and your hands are down by your belt. As long as you're producing, that's you. Why change it? There's, you know, the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. So that's the way we, we, we were with the Dodgers. And then, and then if you're looking up at the sky and you're walking everybody's brother, then you make the change. But if you're like in Brad's case, hit 17 home runs in, in less than a month in your, in your, in your, in your debut as a pro, why would any hit? 78 home runs in the sec for lsu which was the best baseball conference why yeah. would you change a guy like that right. load so yeah. anyway I'll, I'll i'll never forgive bob brenley for doing that so after that the two teams they traded him to were the dodgers and they had russell martin okay so when brad was in triple a with russell martin russell martin would play three games and brad would play one okay so you're never going to go anywhere in that oh. situation so then they traded him to the st louis cardinals they had yadier molina so yeah. when Brad was in Triple A with the with Triple A with the with the Cardinals, Yadier Molina would play three. Brad would play one. So the old saying that everybody needs a catcher, not where Brad Cressy went. You know, wherever Brad Cressy got traded to, it was it was a bad situation. But yeah. had had they not changed him, Ross, and let's just say for instance he was hitting thirty home runs wherever he went, no matter what his swing was, it was Brad Cressy hitting thirty home runs. Who knows? There would have been somebody grab him, but they're not going to sure. grab a guy that's playing once a week. Yeah. Yeah. The the Mark Cressy School of Baseball was established in 1984. Uh, your past students, boy, some names there. Hall of yes, Famer sir. Mike Piazza, Dodger first baseman Freddie Freeman, five-time All-Star Garrett Cole, Jeff Kent, Jeff Jake Kent, Snow, MVP. Michael Young. Are you still running those camps? I am, Ross. I, I, we're about ready to start. So my life is going to get a lot more hectic on June 5th. But that's my that's one of my favorite times is, is watching these kids. And, and those guys, it's great. I'm really proud of the 50 players that we've had that come through camp in 40 years now that made it onto the big leagues. Matter wow. of fact, Ross, two, two weeks ago, we just added our 50th guy, uh, Dominic Fletcher, who we had his brother, Dave. Yeah, I'll never forget. I never forget the mom, the mom, the Fletcher mom is was so nice. And she was a, she was from Italy. She's not like an Italian from the United States that just eats uh -huh. spaghetti saying she's Italian. She was really Italian. So here was Dave. Dave was like six and he was coming to camp, registered for camp. And here's Dominic still in diapers, barely a toddler. And she would have him hitting off the tee in the in the on the uh, parking lot. So here's this little guy wearing only a diaper. And he, she, and here's Dominic Fletcher, who's now the playing the uh, outfield for the for the Diamondbacks. Here he was hitting the ball, and then he would run the bases. She had these little plastic bases that she threw down on the on the blacktop, you know, the cement, right? It's not even grass. And then Dominic would go into home, no shoes on, barefooted, with her diaper on, and he would slide, and his knees were getting all bloody from when he would slide, and he would do this for hours while the David was out uh -oh. playing on the field. So. Um, you know, my camp means a lot to me at least uh, for the kids that make it to the big leagues. But and just as important as the letters I get from the dad saying, when I go out and I can play catch with my kid, I couldn't do that before he came to camp. I'd be afraid to throw it to him because it hit him right in the nose. He yeah. says it's amazing what he learned. So I, those are the letters I really like, you know. The... Now, what months of the year do you have the camp and how long do they last? Well, we go eight weeks. And that's when the kids are off school for summer vacation. So um, we start in the first week in June and we'll go all of June and all of July. Sometimes we went into August, but this year, because of the way the school districts are set up, we're not, we're not doing it in August. Do you have several locations? I, I, I'm down to three. At, at the heyday, we had six. But that was way too much. And I'd probably be dead if I still stayed at six. So I got we have three. We're in Laguna Niguel, Irvine and Chino Hills. Did you ever figure out how many campers um, you've had in 39 years? Well, you got to figure pretty close to a thousand a year. Wow. So 39,000. I'd say probably yeah. more, probably more, probably more. Wow. That's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Mark, is there anything you want to uh, say before we wrap it up? I want our two wives to come now. Um, I'm so proud of Lynn. 
You well, my to. wife's right here, right here, Ross. I've, I've had a lot of fun, Ross, talking to you. It's been a long time, but we, I was, I've always marveled at your memory and the way you talk about things and can really come up with those things that are just between your ears. But and you're still sharp, Ross. I mean, we're, Thank you. we're both, we're both getting up there a little bit. So we're not supposed to be like that. So I was proud that I could remember some of the things I did tonight. And I want to commend you on all what you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, if Jean Ann could step in. She's Jean right, here. right here. Hi. Hi, Jean Ann. Jean, Hello, Ann. Ross. Jean Ann is one of our members and she's a key contributor to our website. Always glad to hear from her. And, okay. and here comes Lynn. And uh, it's been Miss a while. Lynn. Yeah. Hi, Jean Ann. Hi. It's fun. I loved listening. Oh, it was fun, wasn't it? Yeah. You, you always learn something, too. I don't think I you ever hear it enough. I know. <laughs> love, these, love these guys telling stories. It's so much. Yeah, fun. yeah. It was so good to see you. Uh, uh, I have to ask, are you in the desert all, at all anymore? No, no, we're not. And I just okay. miss it. Do you ever go? Uh, we go uh, visit. Yeah, but that, I miss my house. Oh, no, I'm... actually, we were we were neighbors to Don Sutton. Yeah. So, oh, I yeah. miss our house. Yeah, yeah. Rancho Mirage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Rancho Mirage. I loved it there. Yeah. Loved it Beautiful there. place. Yeah. So, well, but it's Waco's. That's right. It's been an absolute pleasure, Mark. To have this time with you and thanks so much for sharing stay well, healthy Ross. both of you stay healthy all right thank, thank you, you so Ross. much thanks. good seeing both we'll of you we'll talk to you again in 20 more years Ross. Yeah, maybe, okay. can <laughs> maybe we can do dinner okay. never know sounds good ross mark cressy tell, tell your son i said hi okay i will thank you. always a fun kid thank you <laughs>